I know that you're like a full-time professor as well. Mm -hmm. You teach at Juilliard, which is actually, by the way, that I, I took a class with, uh, with Dan over here, mm -hmm. or Professor Ott. I don't yeah. know what. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think what's, and, what's um, the difference? We'll just go with doctor. Just go with no. doc. <laughs> hey, you can, if I call you doc, you got to call me doc. I've only had one other professor, professor on mm -hmm. the show. Other than that, I've just been people that are my friends that are like around my age that, you know, go to school with me at Columbia or at Juilliard or some other places. I've even had people that are at Juilliard right now as undergrads. Oh, awesome. They're like 10 years younger than me. Wow. So I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have, you know, more people that are a little bit further along. On yeah, the show. senior so citizen. Yeah. Senior citizens like yourself. <laughs> Except I have more gray hair than you do, which I can't really understand. <laughs> yeah, that's genetics, I guess. No, I... Uh... I and more no hair control. than I do. I have no control over that. <laughs> I'm sorry. But they do make various treatments now, Saad. You can look into it. You know, so. I tried, but it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna work out for me. I'm just gonna go for the Joe Rogan look. Um, <laughs> and I had uh, I don't know if you know Stephen Lias. I uh, don't. He's a professor down in Texas. Uh, okay. And he actually wrote a piece that's very similar in uh, not in aesthetics at all, but just mm -hmm. the content uh this fire mountain yeah. piece that you wrote for orchestra, he had a kind of similar, it was around the same vibe of natural parks. Right. And he, and this piece was specifically about that and commissioned to come and write this kind of thing. And I thought it was interesting because you had a kind of a similar thing going yeah. on, but the aesthetics were completely different. Well, what it, he did. I mean, it could be too that, I mean, this was a, um, an actual program that the national park service had. So they were, um, commissioning all kinds of artwork and uh, handing out grants to organizations specifically to highlight um, a national park. So the commission came about because Symphony Tacoma, which is where I grew up, Tacoma, Washington, or just outside of Tacoma, Washington is my hometown. Um, they wanted to commission a work that was about Mount Rainier and Mount Rainier National Park. So this was one of the grants that they applied to and we got, and um, I think along with some NEA funding or something like that. So it was a, a um, and I think too that, that I'm seeing a lot of works by um, composers especially that are sort of climate related. And this piece is really a, about climate. It's about the danger of the melting glaciers at, the, uh, at Mount Rainier. And um, I mean, I can think of a few other composers, you know, Julia Wolf just had the big thing, um, uh, unearthed. And then, um, I know Sean Shepard, for example, has been writing a few pieces that have this climate theme. So it's, it's definitely out there, of course. Um, but it was special to me because it was like a portrait of like where I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. So that's a daily presence for anybody who lives there is the mountain. We just call it the mountain there. I, actually, I'm lying a little bit because if it were a daily presence, it would mean we wouldn't have as much rain and cloud cover as we do. So you almost never see the mountain. You just know it's there. So right. um, on the rare blue sky days, people say, oh, the mountain is out, you know. So it means go look. Go look at Mount Rainier. So we can't see the mountain, but we could hear what you, uh, <laughs> well, what you actually, with the mountain. So. The, and the, the premiere actually was accompanied by video. And what was interesting there was that rather than – uh, like I didn't score a video. I, I had the video set to the piece. So I had to do a mock-up that was, um, you know, as approximate in timing as I thought like a live performance would be um, to send to um, the videographer who then um, had all, various kinds of footage, um, mountain imagery from Mount Rainier, from the National Park, some drone footage and cool stuff like that, combined with a few other elements. And um, at the premiere, it was actually, the, the film was projected um, during the performance. Now, quick pit stop to let you know that I do offer one-on-one -on -one consultations and lessons in regards to anything composition related. This can range for helping you put together your portfolio for any composition degree that you're applying to, or you might want to improve your creative chops as a composer from week to week or month to month, or you might want to get a better handle of the behind the scenes of what it's like to be a composer. How do you sell your sheet music? How do you negotiate commission rates? How do you apply to contests? How do you apply to grants? How do you do anything as a composer, let alone just writing the music? So if this is you, you can contact me using the link down in the description below. It's, it's interesting because it's very similar to this other uh, project that mm -hmm. we were talking about with Lias, where they had this projection also mm -hmm. going on, but I don't know if it was in the same manner the way it was composed. 
But uh, let's hear a couple of minutes of that so we can give everybody okay. a chance. Part we just heard with the chorus mm -hmm. it doesn't really come in until like 10 12 the right the, the whole piece is like 15 minutes mm -hmm. but we get a little bit of this chorus yeah sound in the beginning but it's not a typical chorus sound it's like a wind sound and then like 10 minutes in you get yeah. like what you would think is like a singing to joy singing. A choral yeah. thing going yeah on. and there's not much text in the piece i mean the text is just this one john muir quote right which is actually inscribed at the visitor center at Mount Rainier uh, National Park, so um, so I used that um, in that that one line from a book um, that he wrote that's about Mount Rainier, and that's sort of the the entire text. The rest of it is um, they're vocalizing, or like at the beginning, there's the wind sounds, and then they're they're kind of a in the backdrop. There's you know a big part, which is very unusual for me. I typically don't write in this this technique, but there's, there's a, a long drone thing that happens in this piece. And so the choir's the backdrop. So they're there for a big part of the piece. And then they kind of go away when it, when the music develops a little bit and then they come back at the end, but you're right. They don't really sing. Yeah. I was shocked because yeah. it's for orchestra and chorus. You yeah. think, okay, chorus is going to be the main thing. Yeah. And then you don't really get the main thing, but then when it comes, it, <clears> it kind of <throat> comes and goes. I thought it was mm -hmm. very formally. I thought mm -hmm. it was, it, it was unexpected that mm -hmm. it was so much orchestra, yeah. so little chorus. Yeah. 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 And I think that that was partly a decision by me to, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I, I wasn't looking for a text for this piece. And so there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot of, you know, a lot of words to set. Right. But I, I definitely had just imagined the choir as kind of a section within the orchestra. So this first whatever it is, seven or eight minutes where they're, they're kind of just, they're a textural thing happening. And then, then I wanted to go away for a little bit and let the orchestra do its thing, be busy. And then the choir comes back for that, the, the yeah, closing, I mean, it, closing it, few minutes. It kind of reminds me of like when you hear, uh, you know, any like, especially traditional, like 19th century orchestral work and they, they wait till two thirds of the way through for the brass to come in or something right. or the percussion, <laughs> they just kind of have rest. Yeah. And you don't expect that with a chorus because with the chorus, you can, you can see it on mm -hmm. stage. So they're not really doing much and you're wondering as an audience member, like yeah. what, what's going to happen with the choir. It so, also yeah. kind of builds some kind of tension it that builds I was tension wondering and about when I was listening to this. Yeah. And I think actually part of it too, I mean, it was, a, it's definitely a piece that I think is best experienced live because we had to work within 
the the logistical confines of the hall. So actually, the chorus was down, um, kind of in front of the stage, oh. and on and and they were antiphonal. So they were kind of distributed on two sides of the conductor because there wasn't really enough room to accommodate. It was a pretty big choir. I think there were like 60 or 70 voices. So like almost as many musicians as the yeah, orchestra. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It was it ended up being like 140 players on stage well. or something. So we we had them at, kind of set up antiphonally and actually the way that it that the sounds are used, I, I, I used a stereophonic kind of approach where like with the wind sounds, it's a sweeping gesture. It's supposed to kind of go from one side of the stage to the other and then back. So you, you, the kind of cool thing, I remember for whatever reason, my seats were like way down, um, uh, orchestra seats way down on the on the left side and so I could sneak out the door and go, you know, mm -hmm. take a yeah, bow on stage. Off the end. but you're kind of like, you don't really get to see much of what's thing. happening that way. And you're kind of down in one zone of, of the acoustics too, but it was kind of cool to like hear the sound kind of travel. And I think for somebody who was in the audience, it was, there's always that cool question of like, Ooh, where's that coming from? Right. Where's the sound coming from? So, uh, that aspect you, you, kind of can a little bit detect you know as you're listening a little but, bit yeah but, but when you hard. see the score i mean you 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 know i i've mentioned this before on a show that when you see the score you're a little bit more hyper aware of instructions like that mm -hmm. so yeah maybe i maybe i pretended yes i could hear it from left to right what's yeah. going on but right in truth probably if i didn't have the score in front of me i probably wouldn't have even thought that there was some panning effect going on yeah especially if i wasn't listening to it with headphones on right which i usually don't i usually just listen to it on my speakers because mm -hmm. I don't like to have those things on mm -hmm. if I don't have to have them on for whatever, you know, for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. yeah, no. Um, and that was too, just a recording. That's a recording that was set up for just capturing a performance, right? right. Not for, for a studio rec recording yeah, or something like that. So, um, you, you do, you definitely lose something, but yeah, it was so there, I think, you know, to the point though, about not using sort of withholding the choir there, like the audience is aware that they're doing stuff like they can kind of see cause they're lit a little bit as well. So they can kind of see that that's happening and they can see the way that the, the conductor who is um, my, my friend, Sarah Ioannidis, who I'd gone to school with. So she would gesture to them and stuff and kind of have to almost turn around, you know, almost with her back to the orchestra to sort of conduct the choir in the beginning. So there was definitely that sense from the audience that like you kind of, it was some theatricality to it. So yeah, that's yeah, definitely. Cool. I mean, when the choir is in like the pit area, yeah, I mean, you right. gotta have to right. uh, acknowledge that they're there from the beginning and mm -hmm. you do that in the piece, which is very cool. I was thinking like the whole time I was listening to this too, cause it's, it's quite a chunky piece and there's a lot of notes in mm -hmm. it. Um, a lot of graphic elements and things like this. I yeah. mean, and I know that you're like a full-time professor as well. Mm -hmm. You teach at Juilliard, which is actually, by the way, that I, I took a class with uh, with Dan over here, mm -hmm. or Professor Ott. I don't yeah. know what. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think. What's, and what's um, the difference? We'll just go with Doctor. Just go with no. Doc. Hey, you can, if I call you Doc, you gotta call me Doc because I have oh. a Doc. I have a Doctor now too. Okay. Okay. No, Dan. Please. No, but um. <laughs> I took a class with you. It's a, it was a really great dance class, which mm -hmm. was it's still one of the most memorable things that I did at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this at the time, probably after the class, or maybe sometime around that time, I didn't, I, I didn't realize that you also were teaching at Fordham right. across the street, where yeah. that's like really your real gig. That's my, that's my day job um, at Fordham University, and I'm actually going to be taking over <laughs> The clock is ticking. About a couple of weeks, I'll be starting as chair um, this summer. So uh, that'll be my sentence for the next of three the years of the department. Yeah, yeah not the, the philosophy department. Not that, although we are a dual <laughs> discipline department. We're the Department of Art, History, and Music. So you know, there's there are two totally different disciplines, um, but one department. And so yeah, I'll, so I'll be chair of that, and that's going to definitely be. Uh, according to everyone that I have, my colleagues has had to do it before me, it's going to be a kind of all consuming um, yeah. appointment and uh, for the next three years. But, um, but yeah, so Fordham has been my, my gig, you know, for, um, f for quite some time now, like, believe it or not, almost 20 years. 
Um, wow. but, but I've at that same time, I've also been at Juilliard. So I never left. Uh, I was <laughs> joke. I just showed up. I still got an ID that I think is a student picture. <laughs> Cause you got your doctorate from Juilliard. I right? did. I yeah, got my yeah, master's yeah. and so my you never, DMA. You never left that block. You just stayed there. <laughs> no. And I remember a long time, like for a long time, like guards saying, are you a student? You know, as I would enter and I'm like, no. I'm, and so is that why uh, you have the beard now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, I've, I've pretty much always had the beard, but I never, yeah, I never left Juilliard. Um, and that the choreo comp, the choreographers and composers class that you took, um, and and f- for which you wrote an incredibly memorable piece. Like we'll, I will never forget. We always talk about the piece of the bulls. You know. Oh yes, I barely <laughs> remember. The piece. Yeah, yeah. We still talk about the bulls. The piece of the bulls. Yeah. yeah. Um, which you can watch on the channel, by the way. It's somewhere deep, four or five years ago, yeah. posted. Hold, hold for applause. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but that class was a class that I took as a student when I was getting my master's there. And, um, you know, developed a, 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 a closeness to the professor at the time, uh, Pia Gilbert, um, who passed away just just five years ago, you know, I, I kind of became her assistant for a little while, um, assist helping out with choreo comp. Um, and then the, she also had me kind of co-teach a class on the second Viennese school, uh, with her, which was kind of what her specialty and was, I mean, it wasn't really just about the music. It was actually about the entire, um, you know, Vienna, the fin de siècle, that whole milieu of artists and writers and painters. Culture. Yeah. Wow. The whole thing. And, you know, Schoenberg and Weber and Berg, that like I would sort of do the music parts when we needed to, but then, um, she would handle the cultural aspects and talk about, you know, Klimt and Kandinsky and Kokoschka and all these amazing, um, figure and Egon Schiele. Um, and then kind of have everybody over to our apartment to do <laughs> like a, to have some, uh, Viennese coffee. So coffee with whipped cream, so the whole thing, the whole thing. <laughs> and then do like show and tell with like looking at artwork and all this kind of thing. But at, at any rate, she was really a, became more than a mentor to me. She was like almost a part of my family. She, you know, my kids called her auntie Pia. And, um, it, when she was ready to step down from, choreo comp class I took over for her and I've been there ever since and so and now uh, I, I've actually had to let go of a few of the things that I do at Juilliard because I'll be chair in my other job um, but the one thing I I would never get rid of is that class because it's just it's so special to me and it's just a joy um, every year it seems we get Every year we say, gosh, this was the best year, you know? It's just fun. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. And it, I mean, I remember being part of that class. And if you have the opportunity to work with dance, I, I highly suggest it because it takes a lot of pressure off of the the composing process. Like it makes yeah. you, for whatever reason, it gives you permission to do things that you probably normally would not have done in a normal circumstance. Right. Like, you know, and I wonder, you know, uh, and it's it's and it's also difficult because you know you don't have the chance to practice a lot with dancers mm-hmm. in a way. Right. So it's like okay, that's my shot to do dance, and then I yeah. go back to doing my normal thing. In a yeah, way. I mean, I think the goal of the course. I mean, we we Pia actually used to say all the time that um, it's the process, not the product, mm-hmm. or she would say it more eloquently than that. But the the goal of the class is beyond a production and just for, you know, for our viewers at home, um, there are six dance students in the dance division and six composers and they're paired up in the class and then they create a work and we produce that in a, in a performance, um, you know, with full lighting and costumes and live music and all that. But I like to think that it's one of the things that people look forward to seeing at the school. It's, it's always been a popular, um, production to, to see because it's one of the few things that does collaborate between the different divisions of the school like that as a, an actual course. Um, but yeah, the idea there is to, especially for us composers, we're writing music can be, let's face it, somewhat isolating. And yes, we do have collaborations with performers, right? We, we have, um, especially as students, we have friends that we make, um, you know, this cellist that you know really well, you write them a piece, or this pianist, etc. But to have that opportunity to say, this dancer, right, this choreographer is a person I want to work with. And 
to your point about allowing yourself to do things that you normally wouldn't do in a collaborative setting that you wouldn't do on your own. I think that's a good lesson for when, even when you aren't collaborating, right. you know what I mean? So what's holding you back? Sometimes it's logistical things, practical things, but creatively, if you kind of see certain avenues open up that you do in dance or writing music for dance, let's say, maybe those things can also inform what you might do just in like a concert yeah. setting. I mean, I think, I've, and I've spoken about this before. Uh, I think part of it is just Juilliard in general. Cause mm -hmm. I remember when I, uh, when I first went to Columbia for my doctorate and I was presenting some of the music that I wrote, I, and compared it to some of the other, I mean, you should never compare to others, but you know, you can't help it when you're a first year yeah, at a doctorate. Don't program. compare yourself to others, kids. <laughs> but I couldn't help but notice that, wow, my stuff, I thought I was not true. I thought I was the outcast at Juilliard. I thought I was the non-traditional guy. And I mm -hmm. show up to Columbia and I'm like, I'm like, you know, hiding over there. <laughs> you know, like, look, <laughs> there's looking at nothing me and <laughs> wrong. You're talking. And I said hiding on purpose, card carrier, card carrier, by the way. <laughs> oh, file. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're a big hiding fan, but, um, you know, recently that, that a big was, hiding um, fan. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, who? I mean, who? I mean, if who isn't you know? But well, we, I mean, we could do we could do a Haydn podcast <laughs> because I would love to talk about you know the symphonies for an hour and a half. But yeah, so oh, that's kind of interesting. So when you kind of like walk into a place and you're like, I'm the one doing the crazy stuff with the graphical notation and and um, yeah, the, the, look, there's there's an important lesson there's always somebody crazier right <laughs> that's true and then it actually that's that's when i allowed myself more because like to me the bowls piece whatever mm -hmm. to me that's like that's like an you know that's mm -hmm. like a very straightforward piece to me now mm -hmm. and now when i'm doing stuff i'm like you know i i always try to find what's the next step but then i'm writing when i get to pieces like orchestra like what you did you know, I think, okay, then that, that's the part of my brain where I'm like, okay, yeah. wait, I got to tamper down. You do. A little I think bit. You, you do. Know? I mean, I think, so I think there are, I mean, we talked sort of jokingly earlier about like the big guns, right? There are those big gun composers who can sort of like everything they write might as well be for the Berlin Philharmonic or whatever. Right. right? But for those of us that, you know, our, our music is going to maybe be performed by a regional orchestra, for example, like there's certain, like there's a, I think a, a real art and skill, and I don't purport in any way to possess this knowledge because it's, it's something I find that I have had to work on and, and sometimes struggle with a little bit. Um, but sort of tamping down expectations, which sounds terrible, but it's more about like, you know what the, you know what the restrictions are going to be. You know that there might be one performance as opposed to three. Like if you're doing like a major orchestra and you're going to have a right. run of shows, like maybe one, maybe two, uh, one or two, um, if you're lucky. And you know that the rehearsals are not going to be devoted, like in a big way, to your piece. They're going to be working on, um, you know, the, the other major work. They're going to be working on, you know, Beethoven 7 or whatever. But it, it, so, so you have to balance, like, your creative desires with the practical sense of will this come across? And, and, and is there going to be, like, a learning curve that I have to achieve with some of the players? So I think, like, for me, what, like, with, the, with Fire Mountain, because there is a fair amount of graphical stuff, I, I tried to keep it all, like, within a certain... I mean, I, I don't tend to go really far out there and experimental myself anyway, just as a composer. But with all the graphical stuff, I said, you know, what is, what's going to be the thing where it's really only going to take a minute of explanation to the mm -hmm. players from the, from the podium so that they're not going to eat up tons and tons of rehearsal time? You know, throw in the element of a chorus on top of that, because of course you remember the choir is going to have been re rehearsing separately, right, with a ch choral director. So that adds another layer of complexity when you get finally everybody on stage together. But yeah, finding that balance, um, it really there's a there's an art and a skill to it, and it and it, it takes experience. And just if we're fortunate enough as composers to get those opportunities to write orchestra music, like you know, that's it you have to build it. And so that's why I always feel that writing an orchestra piece in a lot of ways, it feels like the first time every time. 
it's just like certain things orchestrationally, I guess you kind of know, and it's like, yeah, that didn't work so well last time. I'm going to avoid this. Mm -hmm. You know, the definitely bass trombone should stay out of this register. You know what I mean? Like you kind of learn those things, but like the, how am I going to write the piece that's going to come across the best? And I will tell you that like, for me too, like the thing is, um, actually not so much the experimental stuff, but the notes and rhythms, like, if those are hard, like that's what where the seams I think are going to show a little bit in an orchestral performance, like the tempo and the fast music is going to have to be brought down a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you're going to lose a little bit of the zip that you want in that moment. Like like those the certain sacrifices we'll have. We're going to go a little under tempo here so we can stay together. Like that, like notes and rhythms are can also be the the challenging aspect too. Not like the boxes and the crazy stuff. You know what yeah. I mean? So I mean, I always find with like a fast string writing, especially if I don't have it doubled with some sort of per- percussion even if it's like a light percussion mm-hmm. it'll just go out the window I, yeah. rather, I might as well not write it at all that is a good trick <laughs> that is a really great yeah I, and i know what you mean like um notey fast string writing yeah and if you're uh, you know you have to be super now we're getting really Real into the weeds but right they, but you get into are, certain registers smart. yeah they're smart the people that are watching they're mostly yeah. composers well of but, course so. they're smart they're watching you <laughs> now they the um the yeah you're getting up and you know asking the first violins and play this notey 16th note mm-hmm. passage fast up you know up on especially the especially like if yeah. you if you go to like a christopher rouse uh oh rapture gosh. you know yeah. for example that piece um a lot of it is 16th notes in the um in the strings and they're all playing unison basically even if they're chords but yeah. you can hear it clearly without percussion because all of them are doing it yeah <laughs> and uh physically you can see it yeah. And you can really hear the sound, but if you just have first violins doing it, you know, yeah. and forget it. It just doesn't, even if there's 16 of them, for whatever reason, they don't have the power. Yeah. I, there's a, you know, there's something that, like, I remember it dawned on me a few years ago, and it may have been in conversation with another musician, because I just was thinking about my own work, and I was, I was writing it, actually, a chamber piece at the time, and it was a, a wind quintet, actually. And I used to play the horn. That was my instrument um, growing up. So I kind of felt like, and I played in wind quintets a lot. And I was sort of like, you know, I, you know, I, 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 it, I feel like I could do okay writing a wind quintet. And then I was having a conversation with somebody and they were like, you know, we don't, we don't get to play a lot of things together in new music. Meaning where the, there's, where the like unison moments and stuff. And I was like, I'm, I'm guilty of that. I was sort of, I just, that school of like counterpoint, different density, thing. Yeah. Density. Complication. Yeah. Right. And so uh, and then I was like, okay, there's going to be some moments where everybody gets to play the same thing mm-hmm. <laughs> at the same time. And you, what you, re- what I realized from that is that th- that's more than just like a timbral or a compositional choice. It actually lends um, that kind of performance security, those moments of arrival and playing something together, mm-hmm. aids in performance um, quite a bit. Like just because there's that, you know, oh, when we get to letter J we can wail I mean, on this yeah. part, right? Because we're all together and we do this thing and then go apart and do, you know, yeah. do your camera. This is something I'm obsessed with, actually. No in kidding. Recent stuff. I do this all the time now. Mm-hmm. It's like everybody, well, it has a lot to do with Arabic music because the whole thing is heterophonic. Right, right so exactly. There are yeah. moments where I want to, but my whole thing is I want to, it's like a spectrum between Western and right. Arab music. So it's not always heterophonic. So mm-hmm. there would be moments where it would be all unison, mm-hmm. but then maybe one of the instruments starts, I, I say, okay, play the same melody everyone else was playing, yeah. but veer off just a little bit. Yep. Here's an example of what I mean. I, I put this extremely complicated rhythm that's, yeah. that is in effect in unison with mm-hmm. the other rhythm, but I don't keep going. I just say, okay, it's like this, but keep going. And then I say, okay, the yeah. next instrument does it. And the next instrument, and then all of a sudden you get this like, thing that's the yeah. melody but it's all off a little bit yeah and i that's and cool this is something that i am really into now because you know it's something that like what you said before you can explain it mm-hmm. and then they'll get it mm-hmm. and then it's like whoa i can actually do this new yeah. technique but it's not really new because it's from another culture in a way. right right yeah and then there's also kind of the i guess the technical choice of how you how you choose to notate or not something like that. Like, you know, occasionally students will, will come to me with like an idea, like I want this particular sound and I want them to kind of do this. And it might be something kind of what you're, you're suggesting. What if I just want this person to drift, you know, away from the tempo or whatever. And I, and I, 
and they said, can I just write a note? And I'm like, yeah, you mm -hmm. can write a note, but like it, it probably isn't sufficient. There needs to be some way in which you notate it. So you kind of have that decision to make of like, do you want to go the, the more, you know, just to kind of use, you know, mid 20th century example, do you want to go to the more ligety route where like everything is notated precisely to create a sound of, you know, being off or whatever? Yeah. Or do you want to go more Ludoslavsky route where, you know, you allow freedom and just have a figure and they play it in their own time. And, and, and sometimes the results are remarkably similar, um, you know, in terms of sonority, but, yeah. So like, I think our big challenge for something like what you're describing is that, you know, how do I notate this in a way to give an idea? I yeah. don't want to write the whole thing out because I don't, that's not the point, right? The point yeah. is to have the freedom, I suppose. Well, cause when you're looking at a score and you're, and you're playing it, it like you're playing horn, you're looking at something, you're so focused on the notes and the, and mm -hmm. the rhythms and things like this, but then you forget about making the music. Yeah. And that's often what happens yeah. with, uh, new music. But, um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get this feeling at all, uh, and this is my segue <laughs> to your, okay. to your clarinet uh, sonata, which right. you just finished writing. So and, and, yeah, um, nearly, nearly, nearly finished. <laughs> well, there, well that, there's a movement of it that's done. Yeah, but yeah. go please. But uh, I want to just go straight into it, and uh, yeah. let's hear, let's hear two minutes of it. This is the part, the part that I chose, I guess. Uh, this uh, variation four. It's a, uh, it's a theme in six variations. Mm -hmm. And this is the fourth variation, Molto mm -hmm. Espressivo. Mm -hmm. And let's hear the whole movement, not just two minutes, the whole movement this time. It's only like three minutes, so let's, let's hear it. Okay. You know, unlike with orchestra, this is what I was wondering when I was hearing this piece. Unlike with your orchestra piece, you don't really get a test run, right? I mean, you don't yeah. get a test run with the musicians. You can't really figure out what certain things sound like. Yeah. But with this piece, I mean, you have just clarinet and piano. Yeah. So I'm wondering, and this is kind of recent, so 
I mean, yeah, this have, piece is sort of hot off the presses. Yeah. Did yeah. you have kind of like an idea of what this will be like, or did you collaborate at all with the musicians? So, so I'll, I'll say just a couple things. And then, um, the first off, this is a piece that I wrote for a dear friend mm-hmm. whom I've worked with for, I don't know, probably a decade. Um, Pascal Archer, who's a clarinetist, and he also has a chamber music group uh, in town called Exponential Ensemble. And he's been just a really supportive of my work, and he programs pieces of mine frequently. Um, And I think you can attest, like, composers, when they go back into the archives and they play old (laughs) pieces, isn't that just the best where they say, we're going to program this piece (laughs) from 2012? And you're like, amen, because... (laughs) Yeah, I don't have to do a thing. Here you go, you know. <laughs> and um, the instrumentation is is sort of variable in in the group. There's kind of core members, and then adds players on. So, for whatever reason, I've done the kind of opposite of good business in my career, which is to write a bunch of odd, not odd orchestration pieces, but pieces that are maybe not a standard orchestration. Or, or there's got to be almost an occasion to do a piece. Like the best example is. A Piero plus percussion piece, right? Yeah. Seems plus fantastic. one other instrument, right? Oh, so, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, so it's like seven players. Well, if it, and, was, if it was viola, it's not that. It is bad. viola, oh, okay, but it's in addition to the violin and the cello. So it's not oh, okay, like, okay. yeah, it's like it needs it. Like, so that'll never get done, right? <laughs> but, um, but no, the the um, no, but so. But you so know that's, what? Sorry to interrupt, but sometimes. Yeah. I hear that argument a lot. Yeah. Oh, you know, you shouldn't write a standard piece. Yeah. I mean, you should you should write a standard piece because it'll get played. But I have plenty of standard pieces that don't get played. Oh, no, either, no exactly. So. It's like none of it's gonna get played. What? Do you, yeah, it's fine. No. <laughs> um, yeah, write what you want. Um, but it, regardless, so you know, getting back to Pascal, the clarinetist. I so th- this piece actually was a was a pandemic baby because, um, you know summer 2020 um every thing that i had planned things that i had planned kind of for the fall every at that point everything kind of fell through right so i sort of found myself wondering what should i do so i did something that i had never done before which is i just decided to write a piece of music for a friend oh cool not a commission that's that's literally what i did too yeah during the pandemic so um and there's a little bit more to it as well because I had I had kind of come through. I had maybe thought I was not going to write music anymore in about May of 2019, actually. So no, can't blame the pandemic on that. Wow. Uh, it's a whole other thing, but it was just I think a kind of a moment in where I was sort of wondering, like anyway, the, for a variety of reasons, I found that like composing had become difficult. So. I thought maybe the solution might be to just write something that I wanted to write. And my, my son, I have two kids. My, my younger child is my son had been playing the clarinet. I think I maybe harbored <laughs> a little bit of a dream at some point that, Oh, maybe one day my son will be able to play this piece. And I, or somebody who's a better pianist could accompany him and then he quit <laughs> the clarinet, <laughs> but yeah, but, um, so that's okay. That's okay. So I, I started work on this piece and I found it very rough sledding. I had a lot of ideas that I had gotten down, but I couldn't kind of get out of a certain point. And then, um, and so Pascal, you know, bless his heart. He, he was very patient. He never said, I need it by this date. We had thought that perhaps it could be p- programmed on this day. And I, and I just kept saying, no, I need more time. I need more time. And he always gave me that extra time. So. I mean, which is amazing. So the, but this past fall, some pieces kind of fell into place. And this, this is actually a two movement work. Um, the second movement is the one I finish and it is the theme and variations. Um, it has a, it's called a nocturne as well. Um, the other movement is more of a day piece. So there's a day mm-hmm. movement and a night movement. And um, for whatever reason, things just sort of fell into place. And I was able to write it. So it's overall like a 13 minute movement. So it's actually kind of can stand alone. I mean, I was going to say, yeah, Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's, it feels complete in its own. I didn't even realize that. I mean, other than there there are references to the first movement that are in it. So I need to, not that anybody would care or notice, but there's a couple in, in what we just heard, 
wink, wink. What we just heard, <laughs> what we just heard in that fourth variation is actually the quotes, the, the mm -hmm. main theme of the first movement. Um, so that to me, that fourth variation seemed like the meat of the, the it's, whole thing. It's too. the thing I wrote first. Okay, there you yeah. go. Did not know that. <laughs> yeah, and and actually, the theme is of because the theme and variations is actually derived from this music, so you kind and of not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, this was the first thing I wrote. It's sort of, I mean, it's got a key signature. It's sort of embarrassingly tonal. It, but I also didn't care because somehow this is what was coming out after this very kind of fallow period mm -hmm. compositionally for me. And so in a lot of ways, this was like a coming back to life. So it's actually very personal work to me. And I don't mind if it's got tunes and some 19th century harmonies and, you know, sounds like uh, Brahms. There's actually a big section that is supposed to be a quote i won't say what piece i'll let people figure it out but there's this, a section that's a, very reminiscent of a of a of a beloved passage in a brahms work so no but yeah. i mean <clears throat> listening to it you know because sometimes you write a piece like okay and you call it uh, i don't know if you call it sonata you talk you call it sonata. it will well. be it is a sonata yeah, yeah. but at, this, at the same time you know it the piece itself you know it's it's very well well a constructed theme six variations mm -hmm. that kind of thing mm -hmm. is very um it's it's got this quality to it where you know it's not going to scare off you know every clarinetist on the planet and if they want to yeah. play something that yeah is is new it's from yeah. this century they can yeah. play this piece and they don't have to learn a billion other techniques they don't yeah. have to learn this multiphonic and this quarter tone right this, and this air sound this and and it actually sounds yeah. it sounds like a, a very good well that's just the piece. most polite way of of saying old fashioned, so but, it's not, I'm it's, <laughs> but it's not, you know, I'm, I'm being serious because, yeah. um, there is a tendency, uh, to think that, you know, just because you write in this like neoclassical style, you're, you know, you're, you're not with the times, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of crap in neoclassical music mm -hmm. and this is not one of them. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I mean, Ned Roram, uh, who, who was my teacher as an undergraduate, you know, he said, you know, you're, you're, of the times because you live in the times like you're there's not a matter of being up like this whole idea of being with the times so to speak um we're all of the times we're all walking the planet uh, yeah. right now so um but i you know kind of straying maybe a little off topic but just to the idea at at some point as you get if you get old enough you do kind of see that like there is a generational shift has happened. And I, I actually found myself confronting that moment far earlier in my career than I ever thought I would. Like maybe like by the time I turned 40, if not a little before, like there was a big change. It was, and it was, I've sort of felt like maybe my generation or composers around my age that had had maybe a similar kind of upbringing, compositionally speaking, like there was another generation of, of composers, like maybe born, let's say within five to 10 years later that had a kind of different outlook about things. So there's, there's a big change. And so that can lead one to question a lot. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, am I, am I, it was what I'm doing legit. But then this magical other thing happens, which is at a certain point, you don't give a shit anymore. Exactly. <laughs> well, well, this is why I'm saying, this is why I said what I said, because I think there are composers still that say, that write, let's say in this style, for example, mm -hmm. and, but they disregard everything else, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And they just don't, they don't want to even acknowledge that anything else is, exist, is existing yeah. really. And I've, yeah. and I've encountered that. But you, by, you know, my our little anecdote about my bulls piece or whatever yeah. earlier yeah you know you're open to all of it you hear it you know it, it exists but you yeah. still write in your you know, and your i'll style. incorporate those things when i when i yeah. need but that's, to or when that's I want what to. i'm yeah. saying yeah is that just because we're living in this time and people are doing all this mm -hmm. crazy shit mm -hmm. which i see all the time mm -hmm. uh, especially when you see too in new york city i mean that's the, yeah. the epicenter of like the, the whatever the newest hot thing is yeah but you still write in a way that people might think is old fashioned. Yeah. That actually is the sign that you are writing what you're supposed to be writing. I also think that I, I have always had a kind of core value, I guess you could say, not my favorite term, but I think 
for whatever reason, a part of my identity as a composer was always that there is going to be a moment with a tune. <laughs> like, do you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, I, I just, it, it happens, and, you know, my wife will joke about it sometimes. She'll say, oh, here's the spot where the tune happens, you know. Um, because, you know, you get to hear someone's music enough, you sort of can understand what's coming next sometimes. But, yeah, I, I think I... I I want to like I just was looking for something that moved me I guess um, as I was writing and this is this is what came out but I was also kind of working again within a theme and variations there's compositional stuff that like is like pushing puzzle pieces around but I was kind of like how can I make this now work as like yeah a kind of pretty moment in the piece yeah, yeah no, and then it takes I mean yeah. it takes a lot of <laughs> and when you're working with like a relatively limited uh, number of materials, yeah. when I when I say that, I mean like you know, in terms of you know the tonal aspect, yep. the the form, and that it's actually gets a set number more of pitches difficult. And things like that, yeah, it's more difficult. Yeah. But when you're when you're in, in the mindset that oh everything is open to me, the yeah. kitchen sink is open, I can do this, I can do this, and I naturally the piece kind of gets longer and longer and longer. Yeah. And I've heard those kind of pieces. And but it might not make for the best listening mm -hmm. experience, not yeah. just because of the accessibility, but just literally I'm sitting there listening. I don't I can't really tell what yeah. I'm listening to. Right. And that kind of thing. Yeah. And for me, too, I think, you know, having coming having come through this period of of not so much creativity in my life, like I found the finding the theme and variations format. I was like, mm -hmm. OK, here we are, you know. Is it is it me or is it eighteen fifty? You know, like <laughs> like where like but finding this format actually allowed and I and I restricted like literally almost every note in the piece is derived motivically from a couple of sets. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that some of those sets can be melodies and be tunes and can have some, you know, triadic harmony and stuff. But um but everywhere else in the piece, even the thornier bits, like everything is derived from a couple of motivic cells. And re like limiting myself just to that was actually the key to kind of unlocking whatever had been, you know, not working up here for a while. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. And I mean, this is something that we were talking about upstairs, but um, mm -hmm. when, you wrote the, when you wrote this particular piece, you, were, you finished it all in three weeks? Over at Yado, so you were at this residency. Oh, yeah. Was it, was it all? Was it? Yeah, all we're gonna and... uh, we're gonna cut this listener because it's a little wrong. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so no, I actually this piece was written. Uh, this movement that we just heard was written um, in the fall and, and the winter, and then uh, I was finishing the other movement, the companion movement. Okay. While I was at Yado, I just got back from from Yado like um, like a week week and just over a week ago, and the goal was to finish the other movement. And I, I made good progress on it, but that's not done. So this summer I'm going to be finishing the, okay, what, so what'll this, end up being the first movement of okay, the Okay, so this wasn't done at Yado. No, okay, the thing that we just before. heard was 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 hammered out over you know some um, months. Um, okay, okay. Kind of going back to like November, October, got it, November. Got it. So it's yeah, the longer process getting this done. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. I'm a slow worker <laughs> anyway, but this was kind of ridiculous. Like, so, so interestingly, the piece that I started years ago during the pandemic, like, that's actually the movement that's still not done that I've been working on. Right, I so piecing back it all that. together. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, put that's kind of like together. what it is sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and then the whole thing will hopefully premiere in October. So, yeah, October cool. 5th. Yeah, so um, that'll be that'll be kind of cool. But yeah, but uh, you know, Yada was was amazing. It was this incredible experience that everybody i hope has an opportunity to have which is to you know not have to kind of worry about life and work and supporting yourself and all of that but so how does that how does that work exactly though because <clears throat> you know you're a full-time professor you mm -hmm. have kids you yeah. know you got a lot going on yeah and then you decide okay i'm going to spend three weeks away from all of that yeah i'm gonna how does that even so from this application just for people for folks to know how does this work so yeah. from the from the point of even deciding that you want to do something like this mm -hmm. to applying to what do you even tell them that you're going to do there yeah or if you tell them anything yeah and then what happens there yeah what actually goes on there and yeah. uh, and how were you able to get out of your all your yeah. responsibility yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a lot of a lot of questions so I have. dear yato committee <laughs> i worked on the project i proposed and i finished it <laughs> but uh, no the um no it's a really good point so for applying for residencies you know they have these 
usually a couple deadlines throughout the year, depending on what time of year you're applying for. So if it's a full year, if it's open year round, like you have one deadline maybe in January and another one maybe in August or something, depending on when you're, you, you hope to be there. So I actually have uh, known that for a long time that I, I have called the, um, the weeks that lie between the middle of May and the end of June as like the sweet spot. And that's because I'm done with school, <laughs> but my kids aren't. Ah, <laughs> okay. So, they're, so they have like yeah. something to do during the they day. They have, have like, no... <laughs> I'm done. I've turned in grades. You know, I've graded every final. I've submitted all my grades. And these kids still have another six weeks of school left. So, and in the past, like I've always said, okay, this is when I, I felt pressure. Like if I'm going to write music, I got to do it now. Um, so the, the thing is to be like as productive as possible during that period. But I think, um, Sometimes, you know, life also can intervene. I, I thought, let's, I need to get away f for these weeks and just try that. Um, so a very dear friend of mine, another great composer, Manuel Sosa, um, a Juilliard colleague and, and someone I've known since my very first days as a New Yorker, like 26 years ago. And he's been to Yato a number of times. And he said, he said, look, you've got to apply. Just, you need to go. You need to do this for yourself, you know. Like and a reset, almost. Yeah, so yeah. It, it really was a reset in so many ways. Um, I had not done a residency in almost 20 years. And that was before my kids were born. So, um, and that one was a month-long residency. And it was, you know, I was, it was easy to get away. I wasn't tied down to an academic job. I was sort of, I think, adjuncting at the time. And I went, it was in the month of January. So I knew that I would miss like the beginning of a semester or something. But so I just was able to like get some classes covered or something like that. Yeah. But still, and like. Probably in January too is not a very uh, popular month. I no, this too. residency is only in the month of January though. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay, so, okay. Um, so I had done that. I loved it. And like the best I mean, you've done these things too. I mean, often the best thing is the people you meet there, right? The other artists are, you can kind of, because they're not them. composers. No. Nope. And usually it's like, you're the only composer yeah. there. So yeah. you're, you're there was like one the other composer guy. at Yato. Yeah. The, the, but for a while I was the only composer and you've kind of feel special, like, cause, cause you know, people, when you say, what do you do? Composer, they always want to go, Ooh, you know, because there's tons of writers, right? There's tons of visual artists usually, but so, um, people want to talk to you at yeah, dinner. Yeah, I feel like residencies yeah. for whatever reason is more common with right like novelists yeah. and yeah. and painters that yeah. kind of thing. It's not usual yeah. that there's that many composers for right. whatever reason, I don't know why. It seems like a perfect thing for a composer and they give you a piano, did they give you a grand yeah, piano? Yeah, I got a, kind I, of thing, I was so. lucky. I got the place I got the room with the grand piano. I mean, just a beautiful living and working yeah. space where I was completely alone. I didn't have to, um really pampered i mean i didn't have to share like i had no neighbors right i yeah. just was in a in a, a cabin basically it was basically a one-bedroom apartment by myself in the woods overlooking water right up against the yeah with a deck looking over a lake with trees and i mean it's incredible i had a woodchuck that came and visited me most mornings <laughs> um but um no it was so in seriousness like if i have to give any kind of psa it's this. So, I mean, we talked about the kids thing and we talked about the, you know, work responsibilities and everybody has some, there's some mixture of that and everybody that we know is a creative person in their life. You know, if you are somebody who supports yourself through music only, that's hard because, you know, you're always 30 days away from ruin. You often have to travel a lot. So these people are always on the road and that can be difficult for relationships and all kinds of things. So there are compromises, there are sacrifices. If you're more of a homebody, you have kids, like there's the point of like, oh, and you also want to take a hand in raising those kids, like, you know, then they're going to have to make compromises. For me, it was like, when can I work when I've got kids? What time? And I've got to teach and all this kind of stuff. And it was like the hours between like 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. My God, that's early. Yeah. yeah. So I, to this day, I get up at 4.30, even though I don't have to. But it was it was a necessity because it was the only time that the house was quiet, mm -hmm. right? Because those, those little bastards, they're going to find your ass no matter Somewhere, they yeah, don't yeah. care whether it's a weekend <laughs> or a holiday right or whatever they're gonna wake up at like six 
and they're going to come find you. <laughs> so, well, and, even, and even late night, you know, you're yeah. tired at the, you're very oh, tired. You're the last thing you want to do is yeah. write. Like, at least for me, I don't have any kids or anything. I mean, yeah. after five, six o'clock, I don't want to write at all, you yeah. know, and that's no, not even that either. late. <laughs> yeah. I actually found a weird thing though. I was at the residency, but, um, which is that my, my working pattern totally shifted and I became really? a late afternoon worker. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I was sort of like, up I reverted to my natural state. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Oh, this is what, it, this is how my daily flow should be. Like morning was like, I was t- taking it pretty chill. Maybe go for a walk. Um, but like those, those early, early hours when I would get up and it was dark. I mean, I always, you know, every once in a while I see a dumb thing on, on, online, it'd be like, do yourself a favor, watch a sunrise sometime. And it's like, damn, I've seen every sunrise for like the last <laughs> It's almost 16 too many sunrises. years. Yeah, it's too many. I don't want any more sunrises <laughs> in my life. I wake up, I work in the dark, you know. Um, but getting back, though, to the thing about raising a family and in my case like having a spouse who's um also a musician mostly worked at night like it kind of worked out for us in terms of dovetailing if i'm teaching day classes or morning classes and she's performing and playing shows or or playing concerts at at nighttime like there's kind of a natural dovetailing effect that can work in terms of who's going to take care of kids Mm -hmm. but there's no recipe for it i mean it's it it was that it was a lot of babysitters it was it was all this kind of stuff but my point here it is the big point is this when you're in the trenches of the and there's a good i would say decade of like being in the trenches when you're raising kids and it a lot of people think it's the early years yeah it's that but when they get older they start having ideas about stuff and they start doing shit and they you know somebody's got to take them like <laughs> so you, you they're they get busy right so you think i can't go to residency you know i just can't do that to the person i love you know and, and leave my kids and they'll miss me and all that kind of stuff do the residency figure out how to make it work because i think in my case like it it, it led to a little neglect of my, of, I don't want to say nurturing because I don't like that. I think it gets used too much, but of, um, of just paying attention to being a creative person. I'm not saying that everybody is a parent or whatever, or has things going on in their life, like neglects that, but I, that's what happened to me. I still wrote and I still wrote some pieces that I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, but the production slowed way down and I don't mean that I have to write lots and lots of pieces to be happy, but I think like it, you have to remember that you're still a person, like a creative person and not to neglect that part of you. So if, if you can escape, I was there, for example, with a painter, um, I got a four year old kid <laughs> and she was like, there doing a, I think like a, a four or five week residency. Now that takes some support, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And they were able to, um, I think make it work and also get away and go, go home for some visits just cause they didn't live too far from the residency. So, but you know, th- they, a lot of people think there's no way I can make this work. If you can make it work, you should try to do it. If you're fortunate enough to be able to have an opportunity for one of these residencies, definitely do it. Don't neglect that side. So that was kind of like a, a lesson that I, I kind of learned now, just as in reflection, looking back on mm-hmm. the residency or and being in the residency and looking back on like the years leading up to it. And it's not, I have no regrets. I have no resentment or anything like that. Um, I mean, not yet kids. You could still <laughs> disappoint yet. me as adults. Okay. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get arrested, but like, <laughs> no, um, no, no, no. It's, it's not like that at all. It's just that like, you know, you, you, you make these sacrifices but guard part of it, like guard part of your creative spirit during those years, if you can. You know, that's really great advice and uh, advice for me, just as much as for anyone watching, because, yeah. you know, we're kind of like right on that brink. It's like, well, kids, eh, no kids, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. What would happen when if the kids came and mm-hmm. this sort of thing? It's a lot to think about and it's a lot to... But like you said, if you have the drive and the, not just the drive, drive maybe is not the right word, but like if you're a creative person, like you said, 
like you can't shut that off because then part of you dies and then you then that's yeah. when the you know that's when the dark days come yeah and that's yeah. that's not the point of living i mean it's right. like you know if you're a creative person you have to keep creating yeah it doesn't need to be oh, man, you're for gonna the, make me cry so <laughs> you don't have to write for the berlin right. film but uh, <laughs> But you're writing for, I mean, you're still writing for professional musicians and stuff like that. So it's not like, and you're in that world. It's not, yeah. but you don't have to be John Adams to write a, to write your whatever next piece you want to do. And I think that's what a lot of young people. John Adams has John Adams locked up. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> right. There's John Adams is the best John Adams there could ever be. So, you know, yeah. that's the truth. It's like you, you are you and I, oh, somebody, I, I remember saying, you also can, put aside a little space for like the unexpected to happen in your career mm -hmm. too. Right. Because I think you're, you're talking a little bit like about the, the drive to succeed and to, to, th by the way, the success part of it isn't about, I don't think it's not about the um, recognition and being in the press and getting the article in the times or, or awards or whatever. That's not it. It's w the nice thing is those opportunities to work for at the highest level mm -hmm. with the orchestras the opera companies whatever like you want to have that chance to hear some of those people play your 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 music um so i think that's mostly what that drive is about um but yeah i mean if if, if you're finding that somewhere along your career mid-career you're not that's not what's happening like that's okay. There's, there are other, there are going to be opportunities, and and doesn't don't you know allow a little room for the unexpected, for serendipity, for something to kind of happen because you never know. You never know if like this piece might that you did write five years ago. Maybe that piece does spark somebody's interest, right? Somebody exactly. Picks it's it still up. Still there. Yeah. That's the beauty of composing is that everything is there. It's yeah. Still there. It's not yeah. like. Uh, being a violinist or something where you have to keep it up there's something yeah. uh there's something about having that uh, record that mm -hmm. you wrote that piece like at some point in time i was able to do that you know oh i know isn't it amazing <laughs> when you look back and you're like damn i how did i do that i wrote this piece like i find that it was when i'm writing a piece i'm just like i'll go back and look i wrote that piece i wrote all those notes like, how did I do that? Because sometimes you forget, like, it's the weirdest thing. Maybe, I don't know if you had an experience, but every time I sit down to write, I feel like I forget how to write. So right now I'm writing this piece um, for a you know, big orchestra. Yeah. And I actually have like half of my orchestra pieces like on the, like now right now it's all clean, but yeah. I had, I had them all over the floor yeah. just to remember some of the things that I right. did that I liked so yeah. I can use them in the new piece. Yeah. Because it was funny because my wife was telling me, because I'm writing this piece and my wife is telling me like, why are you trying to restart? Like all yeah. these things you're talking about are things you haven't done before. I'm like, yeah. well, what are some things that actually are good? And she actually started listing some things. I'm like, and then I started to spark way. I can do that in a different way. Mm -hmm. And let me just do that instead of putting so much pressure on myself. Right. So this whole thing about like reminding yourself that you did it before yeah. and that you don't have to reinvent yourself every yeah. time, I think is a good, also a pretty yeah. good lesson well, too. Because, you know, as you enter, um, I mean, dare I say, a mid-career uh, area. I don't and, know what it is. I'm, <laughs> I'm in mid-New Jersey. <laughs> That's how I feel like. <laughs> uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, this, the, 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 no, but as you enter that phase, like, you, you're, I think we're sort of meant to, have acquired hopefully some technique, right? Right. Like that's okay to use the technique. It's okay to use that thing. And interestingly enough, like as part of what I did in, in my residency was I, I, I just said, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen to almost everything that I've written, like from really early that I still allow to be out there. Right. <laughs> I just as a retrospect, well, I was driving actually. So, and I kind of sort of shed some new light on stuff. Cause I realized, okay, I guess, I really only do three things. That's okay. Like most composers do three things. Right. Um, three four, is a good if you're like, three is good. <laughs> you know, some only do two <laughs> and you wish they had a third thing and they're, you're going to hear how pieces are related and that there are similarities. And they said, well, you know, I, I was like, oh man, that groove I've, here I am in that groove again, or, oh yeah, here's the long note tune over the busy, you know, background texture t thing. Right. Um, but I think what you also realize is, okay, 
that's just kind of my thumbprint, right? That's those are just the things that I do that hopefully make my music sound like me and not like somebody else. And um, at at this stage, I'm okay to just sort of not let I'm rewriting or re rehashing stuff that I've already done, but hopefully like just f allowing whatever that experience is that we built up, mm -hmm. just let that come out in the music too, right? Let yeah, that, and don't put so much pressure on yourself to just precisely. do something brand new. And then you stop writing again all over again, and yeah. the whole process repeats itself. Right. I'm just repeating, I guess, what I am going through, I guess. See, perfect <laughs> <But> illustration <laughs> of your point. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, this was a lot of fun, man. I really Thank appreciate you. you coming out. And uh, if you want to check out the rest of Professor Dr. Dan Ott's uh, music, <laughs> It's down in the description below, and I have those two pieces that we covered too. Yeah. All right. Thanks awesome. so much. Thank you. Right. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. It. That's it.